I have never really been worried about whether something was trivial or not. Uh, well, no, that's not true. I was worried. You know, in my early 20s, let's say, uh, people always thought that uh, I would, you know, be a great mathematician and be good at various things and so on. And in my late 20s, I hadn't achieved any of the things that people were predicting. And so I call it my black period. I started to wonder, you know, whether it was all nonsense, whether I was not a good mathematician after all and so on. And then I made a certain discovery and um, was shot into international prominence as a mathematician. When you become a prominent mathematician in that sense, it doesn't mean that many people know your name. It means that many mathematicians know your name. And there aren't many mathematicians in the world anyway, you know, so it doesn't count very much. But it suddenly released me from feeling that I had to live up to my promise, you know. I had lived up to my promise. I sort of made a vow to myself. It was so nice not worrying anymore that I thought, I'm not going to worry anymore, ever again. I was going to study whatever I thought was interesting and not worry whether this was serious enough. And um, most of the time I've kept to that vow. And what has that resulted in for you? What has, has that made you better or more successful or just happier? What's the result of taking that attitude? Uh, well, it made me happier. Yes, it made me happier is the only one of those different things. Uh, I, you know, I sit in a corridor in the mathematics department in Princeton and I think about things and I imagine that the young graduate students there think, oh, this guy's a loony, he did something good once. Uh, and I don't care. I really don't care. Uh, I've been released from worrying about what other people think about, about me. And in a way, he did do something interesting once. <laughs> you know, if I may say that. Um, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing something interesting right now. I don't mean talking to you. I'm sorry, that's really boring. <laughs> Forgive me for saying that. But um, uh, no, I, I find some problem. I try and solve it. Uh, and I don't care whether it's a problem that will advance my reputation or not. I mean, I really don't. Do you care about I've advancing been freed. knowledge, advancing mathematics? Yes, I suppose I do, but less than I did before because, you know, I'm pretty old now. And uh, so if I advance mathematics and I'm not around to see the result of that advancement, then what do I care? Um, I don't know. I don't like thinking of my impending death. Um, and, uh, you know, I haven't got all that many years left. I don't quite know how many. Uh, but I do still like doing mathematical things, so I do. Do you ever feel frustration that you won't see where things are going to be in 50 years or the next breakthrough? Do you worry about the things you'll miss? Uh, no, I don't think I do. I mean, you see, uh, a whole series of things have happened. You know, when I was a kid, and I mean a sort of late teenager, and learnt about all these unsolved problems, it really did seem, there, there were about four of them. There was the four-colour map theorem, there was Fermat's last theorem, the Riemann hypothesis, the continuum hypothesis, okay. Uh, and they had all lasted at least 100 years. Um, and it, it looked as though they were going to last another few hundred years, <laughs> you know. And then they've mostly been solved, uh, in some sense. Continuum hypothesis, solved in a way. Four-colour map theorem definitely solved, but um, the Riemann hypothesis still unsolved. I've forgotten what the fourth one was. Fermat, Fermat solved, yes, of course. Um, so three out of the four were solved, or should we say two and a half out of the four, because the solution of the continuum hypothesis is a bit different from the others. Uh, but um, there's a very definite sense in which it is solved. And that may be the only sense in which one can live with it, so to speak. Um, but they had all lasted at least a hundred years. 
Now, when something lasts 100 years, uh, you're unlikely to be at, in, in it at the beginning and at the end of it. <laughs> that demands that you're at least 100 and, say, 17 years old, provided you're pretty bright at the age of 17. So essentially nobody uh, is in at the beginning and the end. And so we're accustomed, really, in mathematics to have these problems that you don't expect to see solved in your lifetime. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. I mean, you can wail and moan and say, you know, something. Uh, I've heard people say that uh, if, if they are granted the thing to come back in a few hundred years, you know, what's the first question you'd ask? Some of them say, has the so-and-so problem been solved, you know? Um, but uh, really, there's nothing you can do. You can try desperately to solve it, but if it hasn't been solved for a hundred years, you probably aren't going to. Um, you know, it's only given to one person, so to speak, to solve a particular one of these problems. So we're used to it. And here's uh, an atmosphere of resignation, you know. There's also a thing that we don't really know quite often, whether a problem can be solved. I have to ask you then, if you, were to, if you come back in a few hundred years and get one question, what's your question then? Yeah, interesting. I, this is not original. I mean, uh, I'd like to know whether the agreement hypothesis has been solved and, uh, and so on, and perhaps a few more technical details about it. Um, but that's not an original thought with me, so. Do you have unfinished business? Were there things you w wanted to crack or do that you, have, you haven't done? I know you still could do it, but uh, do you have unfinished business? Uh, I don't know that I have, uh, I mean, I have unfinished business in a way, things I'd like to do, but I'm not going to do them, I'm not going to solve them. There's one thing I would really like to know, yes, perhaps if I hark back to the question you asked a little bit ago, there's a thing called the monster group, which is a beautiful, very large, symmetrical thing. <laughs> uh, and I would just like to know what it's all about. Uh, you know, why it's there. Uh, and every now and then, I, I've often said, I've said for 25 or 30 years, that the one thing I'd really like to know before I die is why the monster group exists. I'm resigned now to not learning it before I die. I might just, uh, every now and then I've taken it out, so to speak, I've thought about it for a time. It's about every five years, except I haven't done it for ten. There's never been any kind of explanation of why it's there and it's obviously not there just by coincidence. Uh, it's got too many intriguing properties for it all to be just an accident. So, and what's uh, that number again? 196,883. That's the dimension of the space it lives in. It seems so arbitrary. Oh, no, it's not arbitrary. Oh, <laughs> no, it's got to be 196,883, yes. 47 times 59 times 71. Nine zeros on the end, so this is approximately uh, 8 times 10 to the 53. Okay, that's the size of the monster. This is pretty difficult, it's quite a, quite a difficult thing to try and explain. I think of them as Christmas tree ornaments. Um, you can hang, you know, sometimes you see a Christmas tree ornament which has a number of spikes coming out of it. And... 